Greetings, time travelers. Welcome to Time Trek on Ahmed's World, where we embark on captivating journeys through history. Today, we delve into the life of one of historical figures, Napoleon Bonaparte. In this episode, we uncover Napoleon's defining moment, the Siege of Toulon, and witness his remarkable rise to prominence. After being detained by Paulist Montagnards while trying to join his brother Joseph at Bastia, Napoleon was soon freed by villagers from Bocagnano, where his family had an estate. Despite the challenges he faced, he continued on his way. However, the situation in Corsica deteriorated further. On May 23, a Paulist mob ransacked Casa Bonaparte in Ajaxio, the family's ancestral home. Contrary to some accounts, the house was not burned down but was likely spared significant damage. The Bonapartes were formally outlawed by Corsica's Pauli-dominated parliament, with the exception of Napoleon's 30 cousins on the island. Letizia Bonaparte, Napoleon's mother, was subjected to renewed slurs, accusing the family of being born in the mud of despotism and raised under the influence of the infamous Marbeuf. On May 31, Napoleon and Salicidi, representing the Jacobin government in Paris, participated in a failed attempt to recapture Ajaxio. The following day, Napoleon penned a paper titled, Memoir on the Political and Military Position of the Department of Corsica, in which he finally denounced Pauli, acknowledging his hatred and vengeance. It marked his farewell to his homeland. On June 11, 1793, the Bonaparte family departed Calvi aboard the proselyte, landing in Toulon two days later. This marked the end of their nearly three centuries of residency on the island. With the collapse of Jacobin power in Corsica, Salicidi was forced to flee to province, and by the end of the month, Pauli recognized Britain's King George III as the King of Corsica. Although Napoleon never completely severed ties with his birthplace, he would set foot on Corsican soil only once more, briefly in 1799 on his way back from Egypt. When he ordered the recapture of the island in October 1796, he granted a general amnesty, excluding only the most senior Paulists who had already gone into exile. In his later years, Napoleon spoke with great respect of Pauli, who died in exile in London in 1807. However, as he stepped ashore in province on June 13, 1793, he knew that France would be the place where he would build his future. This marked a significant turning point in Napoleon's life. Leaving behind the turbulence of Corsica, he set his sights on the opportunities and challenges that awaited him in France. The Bonaparte family arrived in Toulon as political refugees, with Letizia's life savings and Napoleon's modest salary, as a captain in the 1st Regiment of Artillery being their only means of support. With the responsibility of caring for a fatherless family of nine, Napoleon's education and ambition became their primary assets. They settled in La Valette, a village outside Toulon, while Napoleon joined his regiment in Nice, armed with a certificate signed by Salicidi explaining his absence. Napoleon received a commission from General Jean Dutille to organize gunpowder convoys for the Army of Italy, one of France's revolutionary armies. In mid-July, he was transferred to the Army of the South under General Jean-Francois Cartos. Their objective was to besiege the Faders, who were anti-Jacobin rebels, in Avignon, a city that held a crucial ammunition depot. Although Napoleon was not present during the capture of Avignon on July 25th, the success of the operation provided the backdrop for his most significant piece of writing up to that point, the political pamphlet titled Le Super de Beaucaire. Written at the end of July 1793, the pamphlet was a fictional account of a supper at an inn in Beaucaire. It featured a discussion among an officer in Cartosa's army, two Marseillaise merchants, and two citizens from Montpellier and Nîmes. In Le Super de Beaucaire, Napoleon argued that France was in grave danger and that the Jacobin government in Paris needed support. He claimed that the alternative was the victory of European despots and a vengeful French aristocracy. Napoleon's character in the pamphlet made optimistic claims about Cartosa's army, predicting a significant increase in their numbers and downplaying the losses suffered in battle. He also made dire predictions for the opposing faders based in Marseille. In this pamphlet, Napoleon couldn't resist launching a self-referential attack on Pauli, highlighting his plundering and confiscation of belongings from families supporting the unity of the Republic. He accused Pauli of declaring those who stayed in the French armies as enemies of the fatherland. This period marked the beginning of Napoleon's military career and his emergence as a writer with political ambitions. 
Lu Super de Beaucaire showcased his ability to articulate his views and argue for the support of the Jacobin government. Lu Super de Beaucaire showcased Napoleon as a true Jacobin, employing sarcasm to criticize the faders. The soldier character in the pamphlet sarcastically remarked, Every well-known aristocrat is anxious for your success. Through eloquence and persuasive arguments, Napoleon's character managed to convince the other diners of the Jacobin cause. The manuscript was shown to Salicetti, a government commissioner in Provence, and Augustine Robespierre, the brother of Maximilien Robespierre. Impressed by Napoleon's political views, they arranged for its publication at public expense, establishing him as a politically trustworthy soldier in the eyes of the Jacobins. On August 24, General Cartos successfully recaptured Marseille, which had risen up in rebellion. Mass executions followed this victory. However, the situation became even more critical when, four days later, Admiral Alexander Hood entered the port of Toulon with a combined force of 15,000 British, Spanish, and Neapolitan troops. The faders, who had revolted the previous month, had invited the foreign troops. With Lyon in the hands of royalists, the Vendée in uproar, and Spanish and Piedmontese armies operating within southern France, recapturing Toulon became crucial for the Republic's strategic interests. On September 7, Napoleon was appointed chef de battalion major in the 2nd Regiment of Artillery. Shortly after, he presented himself at Cartosa's headquarters, hoping to contribute to the recapture of Toulon. It turned out that one of Cartosa's political commissioners was Salicetti, who played a significant role in Napoleon's career. Cartos, lacking artillery expertise, needed someone to take over the artillery on the army's right flank due to the wounding of its commander and the absence of the second in command. With Salicetti's and Thomas de Gasperin's persuasion, Napoleon, despite being only 24 years old, was appointed to the crucial position. Napoleon suspected that his education at the École Militaire played a role in securing this opportunity. He recognized the shortage of scientific men in the artillery, which was primarily directed by sergeants and corporals. His youth was overlooked in an army greatly depleted by mass emigration and the execution of the aristocracy, which had previously provided the majority of its officers. Furthermore, Cartosa's appointments were overseen by his ally, Salicetti, further solidifying Napoleon's position. This appointment marked a significant turning point in Napoleon's military career. General Cartos, who Salicetti and Gasparin privately reported to Paris as incapable, commanded around 8,000 men on the hills between Toulon and Olioules, with an additional 3,000 troops under General Jean Lapoip on the La Valette side of the city. Despite his numerical advantage, Cartos lacked a clear plan of attack. Recognizing the need for effective artillery leadership, Salicetti and Gasparin secured for Napoleon the command of all the artillery outside Toulon by October 9th. Napoleon's appointment was pivotal since the upcoming operation heavily relied on artillery. Salicetti and Gasparin reported back to Paris, expressing their confidence in Napoleon's abilities, stating that he was the only officer of artillery who knows anything of his duty. They soon realized that Napoleon's workload was overwhelming. Nevertheless, Napoleon thrived on hard work and dedication. During the three-month siege, he was aided by two capable aides-de-camp, Auguste de Marmont and Andochi Junot. To understand the challenges faced by Napoleon, one must visit the site of his batteries above Toulon today. The outer and inner harbors, along with the dominating promontory called Legoulette to the west, posed significant obstacles. Napoleon reported to the war minister that capturing Fort Mulgrave, nicknamed Little Gibraltar, due to its formidable fortifications, was essential to gaining mastery over the harbor. The successful capture of the fort would unlock the strategic situation, as it would force the Royal Navy out of the inner harbor and weaken the faders' defense of the city. Napoleon took the initiative in devising a plan to capture Fort Mulgrave. He tirelessly gathered resources, cajoling nearby towns for artillery and supplies. He sent officers to various locations, securing additional cannons from Lyons, Bryanken, and Grenoble. Napoleon established an arsenal at Olioules, where cannons and cannonballs were manufactured. He requisitioned horses from Nice, Valence, and Montpellier to support his operations. His relentless efforts injected a sense of unceasing activity into his men. Napoleon's determination was evident in his continuous communication with the war minister, and even the Committee of Public Safety itself. He sent scores of letters demanding adequate gunpowder, correctly sized cartridges, and addressing various logistical challenges. Napoleon's unwavering dedication to his cause pushed him to go over the heads of his immediate superiors, ensuring his voice was heard.
Amid the chaos and inefficiency of the provisioning system, Napoleon lamented the confusion and waste and the evident absurdity of the current arrangements. In a letter to his friend Chauvet, the chief ordonnateur, he expressed his despair, stating that the provisioning of armies is no more than luck. His meticulous attention to detail is evident in his correspondence, addressing everything from the price of rations to the proper construction of defensive structures. Napoleon's unwavering focus on the scarcity of gunpowder was a constant concern. In a letter to Salicidi and Gasparin, he emphasized the indispensability of gunpowder, stating, One can remain for 24 or if necessary 36 hours without eating, but one cannot remain three minutes without gunpowder. He urgently appealed for more supplies, writing to the Committee of Public Safety about the little attention paid to his branch of service and the challenges he faced due to ignorance and base passions. Through relentless persistence and political maneuvering, Napoleon managed to assemble a formidable artillery train in a remarkably short time. He took over a foundry for manufacturing shot and mortars and a workshop for musket repairs. He secured thousands of sandbags from the authorities in Marseilles. His leadership skills were instrumental in orchestrating these acquisitions, and his status as a Jacobin army officer during Robespierre's terror carried an implicit threat that facilitated his requisitioning efforts. By the end of the siege, Napoleon commanded 11 batteries with nearly 100 cannon and mortars. Unfortunately, Napoleon received little support from General Cartos, whom he grew to despise. Salicidi and Gasparin conspired to have Cartos replaced with General Francois Doppet by November 11th. Doppet recognized Napoleon's dedication and commitment, reporting to Paris that he always found him at his post, even resting on the ground wrapped in his cloak when needed. Despite Doppet's admiration, Napoleon's frustration was palpable when Doppet sounded the retreat too early during an attack on Fort Mulgrave. Napoleon demonstrated immense personal bravery during his time in the batteries and redoubts of Toulon. There are accounts of him picking up a blood-soaked ramrod from a fallen artilleryman and helping to load and fire cannons himself. He believed this act of valor exposed him to scabies, a terrible skin condition that plagued him through subsequent campaigns. Although some historians debate the exact cause, it is likely that wearing the dead man's gloves also contributed to his dermatitis infection. During one assault on an outlying fort protecting Mulgrave, Napoleon was wounded by an English gunner who ran a pike into his left thigh as he attempted to enter the battery through its embrasure. However, reinforcements arrived at the same moment, coming around from the rear. Many years later, Napoleon proudly showed a doctor a deep scar above his left knee, recounting the surgeon's doubts about the possible need for amputation. This event stands as a testament to his physical bravery and resilience. In his book on Julius Caesar's wars, written during his exile on St. Helena, Napoleon drew a comparison between the commanders of the ancient world and those of his time. He noted that modern commanders, including himself, were forced to face the guns and battle dangers firsthand. He often placed himself within range of grapeshot and cannon fire to assess the situation and issue orders, as generals could not keep out of the way of bullets due to the limitations of their field of vision. This first-hand experience on the front lines showcased Napoleon's personal courage and commitment to leading from the front. Despite accusations of cowardice from his detractors, Napoleon's bravery was unquestionable. It is absurd to claim that a coward could command armies and fight in 60 battles. Even between battles, while reconnoitering close to the enemy, Napoleon faced near-death experiences. The number of people killed near him and the bullet that struck him at the Battle of Ratisbon are further testaments to his physical bravery and unwavering determination. His troops, recognizing his courage, were inspired and emboldened by his presence on the battlefield. Napoleon's ability to inspire his troops was exemplified by an incident during the Siege of Toulon. When all the gunners attempting to establish a battery of cannons within a pistol shot of Fort Mulgrave were either killed or wounded, Napoleon named it Homme sans peur or Men without fear. This act of recognition and praise attracted volunteers who were willing to man the battery, highlighting Napoleon's understanding of the psychology of the ordinary soldier. On November 17, General Jacques de Gommier, a highly competent commander, took over from General Dobbit. This change in leadership was followed by reinforcements, increasing the number of besiegers to 37,000. Napoleon and Dugomier developed a strong working relationship. By mid-November, Napoleon had surrounded Fort Mulgrave with batteries, and on the 23rd, he captured its British commander, General Charles O'Hara. Napoleon reported that Dugomier fought with true Republican courage during this action, recapturing the battery and unspiking the French guns in time to increase the confusion of the enemy's retreat. 
This demonstrated the high level of professionalism and training Napoleon had instilled in his troops. At one o'clock on the morning of Tuesday, December 17, 1793, General Jacques de Gommier set Napoleon's plan of attack on Toulon into motion. A column led by Claude Victor Perrin managed to breach the first line of defenses at Fort Mulgrave but encountered resistance at the second line. However, around 3 a.m., despite adverse weather conditions of driving rain, high winds, and lightning strikes, Dugamier ordered the next assault. Led by Napoleon himself, along with Captain Jean-Baptiste Mouiran, this determined attack finally succeeded in capturing the fort after intense hand-to-hand -hand combat. Napoleon's horse was shot from under him during the assault, demonstrating his personal bravery and willingness to lead from the front. With the fort secured, Napoleon directed the pouring of heated cannonballs onto the Royal Navy vessels in the harbor below. The memory of the explosion of two Spanish gunpowder ships left a lasting impression on him. Decades later, he vividly recalled the scene, describing the whirlwind of flames and smoke from the arsenal, resembling the eruption of a volcano. While his account may have contained some exaggeration, the dramatic effect of the blazing ships and the lasting impact of the victory at Toulon cannot be underestimated. General de Gommier, impressed by Napoleon's leadership and valor, gave him a glowing report, referring to him as, this rare officer. The Allies evacuated Toulon the following morning, causing pandemonium. General Lepoip's bombardment of the city from the eastern side added to the chaos. In the aftermath, around 400 suspected faders were executed under the orders of Salicidi and Gasparin, although Napoleon did not participate in those events. The victory at Toulon brought significant and well-deserved benefits to Napoleon. On December 22, 1793, he was appointed Brigadier General and Inspector of Coastal Defenses from the Rhone to the Various. This success also caught the attention of influential figures such as Paul Barras and Louis Stanislas Frerin. Most importantly, it gave Napoleon confidence in himself, reinforcing his belief that he could be trusted with command. The tumultuous times of the French Revolution saw an unusually high turnover of generals, allowing capable young men to rise through the ranks at an unprecedented pace. Napoleon's rapid ascent was a result of the turbulent political and military circumstances of the era. Men like Lazare Hoche and Michel Ney experienced similar advancements. Napoleon's progress, while not entirely unique, was nonetheless remarkable. Spending only a few years on active duty, he had already reached the rank of general at the age of 24. Join us in our next episode as we delve further into Napoleon's military career and witness his continued rise to prominence. We will explore his subsequent campaigns and the strategic brilliance that would reshape the course of European history. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, like this video, and share it with others who are fascinated by the extraordinary journey of Napoleon Bonaparte.